Welcome to this edition of the eClinical Works podcast, broadcasting to you from the eClinical Works National Conference in Orlando, Florida, 2016. I'm Adam Salati, and joining me today are Dave Castle, Director of Care Equality, Jitin Esnani, Executive Director of Commonwealth, and Tushar Mohotra, uh, product lead for interoperability at eClinical Works, and today we're going to be discussing uh, the rise of interoperability. This this new catchword, uh, that's the buzzword that's becoming more prevalent uh, as the uh, industry changes. So guys, thanks for being here today, and we're looking forward to uh, uh, getting an idea of what this means for clients in general. Uh, interoperability. Let's start off with a, with a, a kind of a contextual question. Uh, because interoperability sounds very technical. It sounds very non-medical. And uh, I think some, some doctors may question, what, what does that mean to me? Why do I need to pay attention to it? How would you describe interoperability to a medical professional? Well, thanks for the question. I think I would describe it maybe in a way that uh, it is perhaps a little bit more, more generalized that, than it often is described. I see it as a means for two different systems to be able to provide uh, information, healthcare information in this context, obviously, to another system and its users in a usable way. Sometimes I've heard it described in an actionable way. I, I think it's important to describe it in a usable way because there, there are some specific connotations around actionable that people in the industry have made. So, uh, in other words, at a basic level, as a provider, it's allowing me to, to see information from uh, another system that another system has packaged up and sent to me. There are obviously deeper levels of interoperability where I can do things like file allergies and file medications from other systems into my local chart. But uh, ultimately, it's about getting that information in some usable way between two different systems. Um, so what, let's give, a, give everyone an idea of what your two companies do uh, with with uh, that definition in mind, uh, what role do each of your companies play in interoperability? Sure, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, take this tab first. Um, so Commonwealth Health Alliance is a not-for-profit organization uh, focused on um, enabling the patient's data to follow the patient regardless of where their care occurs. And so the intention is that wherever, uh, a, a, wherever a physician or any other sort of caregiver is taking care of a patient, they should be able to access that patient's data across uh, our network. So we've built this network that enables uh, uh, thousands of endpoints to be able to share that data centered around that specific patient. Yeah, and, and from the, the care quality perspective, we're, we're involved in, in ultimately uh, a very similar goal, but we approach it in a different way, and I think our mission really is, is complementary to the one that Commonwealth has. As Jitin described, their efforts building a network uh, there are others uh, who have also built networks, whether those are, are vendor-based, whether those are, are regionally-based, uh, and I generally refer to them not so much as networks, but as, as really communities that have come together, and the network is secondary, but the communities have come together to meet their data sharing and interoperability needs, and, and networks and other programs have developed out of that. Historically, and this is certainly no commentary on, on Commonwealth specifically, it's just historically the case for all of these data sharing networks, they, they haven't allowed folks to connect in a systematic way between and among the network. So it's, it's a little bit like having a cell phone from Verizon and only being able to call other Verizon customers. What Care Equality's mission is, is to provide the framework for all of these different data sharing networks to connect their clients and their members to one another so that you can cross the not only the, the EHR vendor and other platform boundaries, but also crossing the network boundaries, uh, very much like what the, the cell phone industry has done to connect uh, various cell phone networks together. There's a couple concepts, I think, that are, that are coming up here. You, you mentioned the, the information following the patient. That seems very similar to what CMS is going to ask people to start doing when they're monitoring their cost component, uh, especially of MIPS and MACRA. Uh, so uh, doctors have, have wondered, how am I supposed to be able to uh, uh, see what is going on with my patient across all of these settings of care? And you look like you're trying to provide that information. And then, uh, Dave, to what you said, uh, it sounds like uh, this is a common theme uh, uh, for, for technology as the fax machine that's become such a backbone to so many organizations became more powerful the more faxes were, were online. 
and uh, computers became more powerful the more uh, systems connected to the internet. It sounds like the EHR is going to become more powerful the more networks integrate, these health communities uh, integrate with each other. So it sounds like there's a lot of benefit for everyone, from providers to patients uh, to large organizations, but which offices might want to sign up sooner rather than later for something like this? Well, when we consider prioritization, I think ultimately the, we would think that the, the work that we're doing is valuable to any physician in any practice. Uh, from a, a realistic and pragmatic prioritization standpoint, I think it really comes down to uh, the mobility of your population and who your, your patients uh, are also being seen by, how your, your uh, crossover, if you will, with other organizations falls, and then who the, from a pragmatic standpoint, who the best fit is for connecting to the systems used by those providers. Uh, and I don't know if you guys want to uh, add your perspective as well. Yeah, I'll add on. I absolutely agree. And I'll add on as well that um, it is, the, the mobility of your patient definitely has a bit great impact. But it's also the, uh, it, actually building on David's point there, there's also the diversity of care locations where the patient goes for health and care purposes. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, in any healthcare community, any community really across the US, you have with th things like clinics, you have things like hospitals, those are your traditional healthcare places. Uh, but there are also a variety of other settings in which uh, patients go to for care, uh, portals of their own or apps and tools and so on that they may use, home care settings, skilled nursing facilities, you know, those are the types of places, especially now as we have an aging population, more and more relevant to, the care, uh, to health and care. Um, imaging centers, dialysis centers, there's such a broad spectrum of different places patients may go. And uh, one interesting thing about Commonwealth and, and also care quality is that we're not limited to just EHRs. EHRs are a huge part of our network, but we're really about ensuring that wherever that patient goes for care, um, that their, you know, their data is available to those providing care to them. Uh, how, how does something like this, when we're talking about interoperability, a couple of, of concepts have come before. Uh, and so uh, we, uh, providers might wonder, well, I've already tried to get onto that one. Why do I need this one? So uh, direct comes to mind. That was a big push of, of recently, especially with meaningful use. How does this compare to direct? So uh, I can get that. So um, it's essentially a different use case. Um, is that how I look at it? Uh, the doctors are trying to send referrals to, uh, from, let's say, a PCP to a specialist. That's where direct can help. But this, this is an entirely different use case. Regardless of where the patient has been cared, uh, given care at, uh, you can query the data. And as Jitin was just mentioning, could be a lab company, could be a radiology. It doesn't have to be an EHR. There could be data sitting in an HIA repository for, for that patient. We will fetch that data using a query mechanism and pull it at the EHR level and display it to the provider and make it meaningful so that they can see it in a consolidated way. So it sounds like maybe with direct, you were somewhat reliant on the person on the other side to send you the information, but these networks maybe make you a little bit more self-reliant because you can go find the information when you need it. That's uh, another uh, uh, buzzword that was going around for a while was HIE, the Health Information Exchange. How, how might this be different than that scenario as well? Sure. So that you know, an HIE, you know, capital H, capital I, capital E, Health Information Exchange. Um, it's typically, you know, it's, it really refers to a couple of things. The activity is data sharing, and in many ways, it's, it, this is not that different. But the organizations are HIEs are typically set up more around regions, communities, etc. And they meaningfully serve those communities and those, uh, you know, those, those areas or populations that they serve. Uh, what Commonwealth is, is that it's a national network. So there's no boundaries beyond the US. I mean, it is wherever a patient goes within the US, the intention is that that data is available. And um, that creates a, uh, it really creates a sort of a national fabric for healthcare data exchange and particularly for query and retrieve, which is our current use case. Um, that allows us to enable um, HIEs, EHRs, other types of um, health IT systems to be able to plug in and utilize. So it really is less of a, a distinction, uh, less less of a, 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 a conflict, much more of a, a, just a different type of use case that enables a number of different types of organizations to be able to connect and utilize the same set of services. And to add to that, uh, what, in our experience, what we have seen in the past was that the HIEs would typically be aggregation of data, whereas this is very decentralized. It, it, it could be 
multiple repositories that you are querying and fetching the data for the provider. And uh, you don't have to log into a separate portal to view the data. It's all at the point of care. And that's where the biggest value is. Uh, Oh, go ahead, David. Oh, yeah, just, just to, to give the care quality perspective there on, on the HIE question, uh, from, from our standpoint, and I mentioned earlier the, the concept of communities coming together. Uh, not all of those certainly are regionally based, but some are, and they, they form the, these health information exchanges. Uh, from care quality standpoint, that's just one other type of network or data sharing program that we would see connecting uh, underneath our framework, still providing a, a lot of different value, whether that's around the aggregation services, uh, notifications, other types of things. But for the core use cases where there is a need to communicate with the members of other, uh, other efforts, other networks, they would be able to do that via the care quality framework. Uh, now, we're two, two different solutions, very closely related. Uh, why might a doctor or an office need both? Is there, is there I, I'm assuming we want, want them to be on both, or there, there's some benefit there? Sure, and I'll, I'll take a first stab at that, and certainly uh, interested in, in Jitin's perspective on this as well. But from my standpoint, it comes down to you do want both in all likelihood. Uh, for different reasons. The, the Commonwealth uh, platform offers a number of core services to its network members. And if you're taking advantage of those services, which go above and beyond what, what you would do with care quality, uh, that is sort of its own use case, and, and you would evaluate those services. To the extent that you also want to have the capability of exchanging in this very broad ecosystem of different data sharing networks that care quality enables, uh, being able to query into your local Epic hospital, for example, or uh, allowing connected patients via a PHR provider to come in and get your records, or even accessing uh, records for, for, uh, for a health plan, for care coordination. All of those things you can do through the care quality framework via the, the eClinical Networks Network, via uh, possibly an HIE that you're already involved in. There are a number of different platforms, but uh, all told, there, there are two different use cases, and it's ultimately about the services from Commonwealth versus the, the uh, widespread exchange capabilities from the care quality framework. I'll add on to that. I, I agree. There is, uh, you know, as Commonwealth focuses on that individual and ensuring that individual's data goes everywhere, we have a set of services that will continue to expand that allow providers to be able to exchange that data around that patient in more and more valuable ways that fit into the clinical job that the, that the provider is trying to accomplish. Um, and, uh, but that's where, those are, that's probably the domain in which we will continue staying, whereas there's a wide variety of other very legitimate, valuable interoperability use cases. Interoperability is a very broad and deep environment, and in that case, you are also looking to be uh, able to participate in those types of information sharing networks. So I think you'd be, want to be part not just of Commonwealth and Care Equality, but all those other types of organizations and uh, exchanges that are meaningful to your organization and your goals. The one other thing I'll add is, you know, in the, at least in the short term, hopefully not in the long term, but in the short term, um, as you know, our organizations have sprung up only in the last couple of years, and Direct Project itself, being the, the grandfather of all of this, is only like four years old, really. Um, we're talking about um, many of our um, community members, EHR vendors, for example, but not just EHR vendors, who are participating in one place or the other. And in the short term, it makes a lot of sense for everybody to be, try to participate in a few different places because that gives you better uh, coverage uh, of your patients no matter where they go. Over time, obviously, we hope that you know, that'll all converge and it'll really just be about what is the value you're trying to extract at that moment. And, and just to simplify it, like in the shortest term right now, uh, the most value that a practice can get uh, from is by connecting to care equality is by getting connected to uh, the local epic hospital and the Cerner uh, hospitals through Commonwealth. And that I think is the biggest value add, at least in the shortest term, I would say uh, right now. Uh, things of course can change. Uh, there could be participation from both vendors in both networks uh, or in both frameworks. Uh, but um, uh, in, uh, as of now, that's the biggest value add, which is probably like the 50% of the inpatient market space uh, that uh, these two vendors have. And I think that's a big... Uh, uh, yeah. I'm Go sorry, ahead. I'm just going to have to cut you short there because we're running short on time. The big important question that we want to answer here at this moment is now, what does this mean for the user? What does the doctor see uh, when they go to 
leverage this stuff in eClinical Works. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so it, and in the end, it's it's the data that they are able to see from uh, the Epic Hospital or uh, the Cerner Hospital or any other ambulatory EMR that they are exchanging data with. So it, any critical exchange partner that they have who is on Commonwealth or Care Equality, we will fetch the data, put it in the right chart panel of the progress node, make it discreetly importable like allergies, medications, problem lists, give them an opportunity to view the complete CCDA or any other information could be packaged inside a PDF. That's what they can view through uh, in the EHR. Uh, excellent. So, uh, like I said, we're, we're just about at time here, but before we go, I'd like to ask uh, if, if clients have any questions here at the conference, where can they go to get some more information, or even afterwards? So, uh, myself and uh, our team are at the interoperability booth uh, in ECW Central. Uh, these guys are here uh, through today, uh, and they can answer uh, some questions as well. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we can always be reached at interop at eclinicalworks.com. Uh, for any questions about this. Wonderful. Well, guys, thank you so much. We're going to, like I said, we're at time. We're going to have to wrap up. But I, I think this has been a wonderful conversation. Thanks for all of your inputs. Dave, Jitten, Tashar, thank, uh, thank you for being here today. For the eClinical Works podcast, I'm Adam Salati. You can check out our other podcasts on iTunes, YouTube, and my.eclinicalworks.com. Thanks for watching. This broadcast and its contents are the sole property of eClinical Works and are protected by federal law and international treaties. You are strictly prohibited from making a copy of, modification of, or form of rebroadcasting or re-encoding this broadcast without prior written permission from eClinical Works Public Relations, except as many be permitted by law. This broadcast is provided for informational purposes only. It is intended as a personal, non-commercial use. Product specifications are subject to change without notice. Please contact eClinical Works Public Relations with any questions. eClinical Works V10 EHR is ONC HIT 2014 edition certified as a complete EHR. eClinical Works V10 CC 2014 95 54 47 1.